What's up, everybody? Garrett Rumley here with Duty to Train. I want to continue with our research. So today, um, I'm going to continue, I think, with um, trying to figure out what it means by militia. I might start out with trying to see if there's any good arguments against keep and bear arms um, and what that means. But frankly, that other guy nailed it. And it's not that I'm not trying to look for it, but like when you get the the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution. It's kind of hard to argue when you literally have all of their own words in a bunch of source documents. I've never seen someone do that. So let's try and look that up real quick. But if we're not able to find anything kind of in a quick manner, I'll do some more research. Or maybe I don't even want to. I think I want to have everything on here. So maybe I'll, if I ever want to like hunt down, I'll just have videos of me like hunting, but it's more, it's, I'll just label those as like boring research or whatever. And that way, you know, like don't watch this one. This is me just literally hunting around, but I want all of my research to be online because I want people to be able to see like, this is the research that I did and go, go look at what I did because I've, I'm, I plan on doing literally like hundreds of hours of research into the second amendment. And if anyone ever has a problem with me, I'll be like, go watch this video and you can tell me what you think. Okay. So let's share our screen here. Get down to brass tacks. This is my YouTube channel. Um, oh, I got this going. You can schedule that. We're good to go. Sharing a video on Twitter here quickly. Okay, so <clears throat> let's just go back to here. Um, this is the article from the last video. Just want to maybe start off where we left off. It is inconceivable that the founding fathers. I'm adding that in, would have tolerated the suggestion that a free person has no right to bear arms without the permission of a state authority, much less the federal government, or that a person could be imprisoned for doing so. As the founding fathers realized, every right has its cost, but the alternatives are often more costly. I like how he says often and not always. I just feel like that's an honest take, right? It's not that they're always more costly. It's just often. Okay, so let's what did the Founding Fathers really say about guns? <laughs> Let's see this. Medium. All right. What did the Founding Fathers really say about gun? Dan writes. Oh, this is going to be good because we just went through exactly what they said. So let's see if this guy gives us. And I have a feeling just looking at this, it's not going to be as good. Let's see what this guy gives us in retaliation of our last video. Gun, ask, gun activists frequently misquote and misattribute words to the founding fathers. The founding fathers' idea of the right to bear arms was framed much differently than today's debate. There's a quote floating around the internet attributed to George Washington, his first day of the Union address, <clears throat> which says, firearms stand next in importance to the constitution itself. They, they, are, they are the American people's liberty teeth and keystone under the independence. From the hour the pilgrims landed to the present day, events, occurrences, and tendencies prove that to ensure peace, security, and happiness, the rifle and pistol are equally indispensable. The very atmosphere of firearms anywhere restrains evil interference. They deserve a place of honor with all that's good. I love, I'm, I can't wait to see this guy spin this. As stirring... And I'm not coming into this as like, I'm not claiming to be like this, you know, I will give him his due. I, I swear to God, I will give him his due. Um, but I'm just, I think I'm still like bent out of shape about that first Washington Post article that we wrote or that we read because that guy was just so dishonest that I don't know. I think I'm attributing his like kind of frankly malice onto this guy so that maybe that's not um, being a good researcher. But anyway, I'm being honest about my um, issues. As stirring as that quote is to some people, George Washington never wrote or said that, nor did he say anything to that effect. The likely source of that quote is an article from a 1926 issue of a magazine called Hunter, Trapper, Trader. George Washington is the only founding father being falsely quoted like this. A Google search is all it takes to discover that the majority of pro-gun quotes commonly attributed to the founding fathers are fakes or are taken out of context. Thomas Jefferson never wrote, the strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is, as a last resort, to protect themselves against tyranny and government. These words were first printed by the Orlando Sentinel in the late 1980s. Now, you can go back to my last video. So let's just do this real quick. Put a link in new tab. We'll go back to this one. This is our old document. Okay, so I want to just 
let's like hunt through this real quick because I just want everybody to remember. Um, okay, Jefferson strongly relied on penal reform theories of Cesare Beccaria, whose essay on crimes and punishments were partly responsible just before the Declaration of Independence. Um, Jefferson's idea on government among the passages Jefferson copied word for word was Beccaria's denunciation of laws which forbid, which may be translated, which forbid deporto le army, which may be translated as to bear, carry, or wear arms. That portion of Beccaria, which Jefferson copied in Italian, was worded in the standard English translation of the time as follows. And this is where he talks about, um, you know, if he uh, if you take away guns or if you outlaw guns, only people who are affected are law-abiding citizens because all of the criminals are going to keep carrying them. The only thing that you do is you make the victims more vulnerable. The wisdom of Beccaria, and this is all in my last video, and I'll put the link in the description. You can read it, but I don't have time to go through it right now. But the wisdom of Beccaria was a source of Jeff Jefferson's proposed Virginia Constitution of 1776, which provided no free man shall ever be debarred the use of arms. An avid hunter and gun collector, Jefferson carried pocket pistols, which may be seen today at Monticello. John Adams began his opening statement in the Boston Massacre trial in 1770 with a quote from Beccaria. And in the course of his speech, he added that the inhabitants had a right to arm themselves at that time for the defense. And Adams' own views against disarming the people were certainly consistent with the following favorite passage from Bacardia, which he copied also in his diary. Every act of authority of one man over another, which there is not an absolute necessity, is tyrannical. Okay, that wasn't the one that I remembered. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Adams upheld the right of arms in the hands of citizens to be used at individual discretion in private self-defense. That comes from 26, J. Adams, in defense of the Constitution, of government of the United States of America, 1777. So it literally comes from his own writing. Okay, so what this guy is saying, what this guy is saying, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's some misquoted articles, right? But I'd like him to go through, you know, challenge you, sir. What is your name? Dan Reitz. Reitz is his Twitter account down here. So I'm going to tag all these people on Twitter. Whoa. Hmm. All right, let's see what he says. Went through the other one. Let's go through this one. There's a quote floating around the internet attributed to George. Okay, so um, George Washington is hardly the only founding father being falsely. Okay, so Jefferson also did not say the beauty of the second. Okay, John Adams, who was famously suspicious of unrest among common people, would never have declared arms in the hands of citizens may be used at individual discretion for the defense of the country, the overthrow of tyranny, or private self-defense. John Adams, who was famously suspicious of unrest among common people, would never... Well, I mean, that's true. That's true, I think, because I'm just trying to think, but that is true, right? Because... And I'm, I'm not trying to weasel through, but like um, the reason that we don't have a democracy, the reason that we have a democratic republic is because democracy leads to mob rule. And I think that, and, and that's not, that's not just like me saying that, like, if you look at what happened in Germany in during World War II, that's mob rule, right? If you get 51% of people and all you have is a democracy, then you can subjugate the other 49% because they no longer have any power to fight back. Okay. So John Adams, who was famously suspicious of unrest among common people, you know, I, I, again, you know, where is he getting that from? Because I know that, actually, I don't know this, so we could look this up real quick. Let's see if we can find anything about it. Um, founding fathers on democracy versus constitutional republic. Madison, according to the Atlantic, America is a republic, not a democracy, is a dangerous and wrong argument. All right, let's go.
Enabling sustained minority rule at the national level is not a feature of our constitutional design, but a perversion of it. Dependent on a minority of the population to hold national power, Republicans such as Senator Mike Lee of Utah have taken to reminding the public that we're not a democracy. It is quaint. No, it's quaint. To be clear and accurate on what type of government we have. That's quaint. This is what I'm saying. Like, it's not quaint. This is like, they're just talking down to you. It is quaint that so many Republicans embracing a president who routinely tramples constitutional norms have suddenly found their voice in pointing out that, formally, the country is a republic. There is some truth to this insistence. It's not some truth, it's true. But it is most mostly disingenuous. The Constitution was meant to foster a complex form of majority rule, not enable minority rule. The founding generation was deeply skeptical of what is what it called pure democracy and defended the American experience as wholly Republican. To take this as a rejection of democracy misses how the idea of government by the people, including both a democracy and a republic, was understood when the Constitution was drafted and ratified. It misses, too, how we understand the idea of democracy today. When founding thinkers such as James Madison spoke of democracy, they were usually referring to direct democracy, what Madison frequently labeled pure democracy. Madison made the distinction between a republic and a direct democracy exquisitely clear in Federalist Number 14. In a democracy, the people meet and exercise the government in person. In a republic, they assemble and administer, and administer it by their representatives and agents. A democracy... A democracy, consequently, will be confined to a small spot. A republic may be extended over a large region. Region. Oh, okay. I thought that ended the quote. I don't know why this is like. I don't know why this is highlighted. A de okay. So, um, and by their representatives and agents, a democracy, consequently, will be confined to a small spot. A republic may be extended over the, a large region. Over a large region. Both a democracy and a republic were popular forms of government. Each drew its legitimacy from the people and dependent on rule by the people. The crucial difference was that a republic relied on representation, while in a pure democracy, the people represented themselves. At the time of the founding, a narrow vision of black of the people prevailed. Black people were largely excluded from the terms of citizenship, and slavery was a reality, even when frowned upon, that existed alongside an insistence on self-government. What this generation... Okay, this isn't too long. What this generation considered either a democracy or a republic is troublesome to us insofar as it largely granted only white men the full rights of citizens, albeit with some exceptions. Okay, this guy is doing the exact same thing that the other person did, right? He's he's not arguing like the idea of democracy in the context of the time, right? Yes, like black people were not treated the same as white people. But if you're talking about democracy, you can't say, oh, they treated blacks this way and then discount the entire argument, right? You have to go back into the context of the time. And this guy's not doing that. He's saying, let's right, let's give him some chance. But it seems like this is going the same way as the, other, as the other article. America could not be considered a truly popular government until the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which commanded equal citizenship uh, for black uh, Americans. Yet this triumph was rooted in the founding generation's insistence on what we call come to call democracy. Yet this triumph, let's let's one sec. America could not be considered a truly popular government until the passage. I like I don't know what he's talking about in terms of popular government. Like what what do you mean? Like that you're like you know, representing all of the people uh, until the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 65, which commanded equal citizenship for Black Americans. Yet this triumph was rooted in the founding generation's insistence on what we come to call democracy. I mean, the people, like, the... Just because, okay, I think he's conflating something. I'm trying to like work this out in my head. And it's not that I'm trying to like, like, like argue out of this, but hear me out. I think he is conflating, right? A democracy and a republic can both vote the same way on certain issues, right? 
what it allows is for the minority to stop the majority from doing certain things at certain times, right? So yet this triumph was rooted in the founding generation's insistence on what we would call come to call, I don't know, that's like kind of poorly worded. This is another thing. Sometimes like, you know, I don't know, sometimes like we read stuff like this, like that's a weird sentence. Yet this triumph was rooted in the founding generation's insistence on what we would come to call democracy. The history of democracy as grasped by the founders, drawn largely from the ancient world, revealed that overbearing majorities could all too easily lend themselves to mob rule. Yes, true. Dominating minorities and trampling individual rights. Democracy was also susceptible to demagogues, men of factious tempers and sinister designs, as Madison put it in Federalist Number 10, who relied on vicious arts to betray the interests of the people. Madison nevertheless sought to defend popular government, the rule of the many, rather than retreat to the... Okay, so Madison nevertheless sought to defend popular government. He sought to defend popular government, the rule of the many, rather than the retreat to the rule of the few. Okay, but see, now he's not quoting. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, you know, he gives, so men, so democracy was also susceptible to demagogues, men of, now he gives us like some quotes, men of factious tempers and sinister designs. As Madison put in Federalist Number 10, who relied on vicious arts to betray the interests of the people. But then Madison, nevertheless, and now he's making a different point, kind of going against that, sought to defend popular government, the rule of the many, rather than like, can you give us some source materials? Can you give us some quotes? American constitutional design can be best understood as an effort to establish, and I may, you know, I might be wrong. I might be wrong on this. I, I don't know everything, but I'm just saying it's frustrating when you try to do some research and all you're getting, it seems like, are a bunch of opinions. American constitutional design can best be understood as an effort to establish a so sober form of democracy. It did so by embracing representation, the separation of powers, checks and balances, and the protection of individual rights, all concepts that were unknown in the ancient world where democracy had earned its poor reputation. In Federalist Number 10 and Federalist Number 51, Seminal papers, Madison argued that a large republic with a diversity of interests capped by the separation of powers and checks and balances, which is what we have, would help provide the solution to the ills of popular government in a large and diverse society. OK, so he's he hasn't really said anything like I don't really get his I mean, unless I'm missing something, but he hasn't really said anything. He's basically talking about how our current structure, which is a republic and not a democracy prevents mob rule he just kind of keeps saying that and then it, somehow this is supposed to lead so hopefully it gets there in a large and diverse okay um if such intemperate passions come from a minority of the population the republican principle by which madison meant majority rule if such intemperate passions come from a, a minority of the population the republican principle Okay, by which okay, so yeah, the 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 Republican principle, like the people of the Republic public, the principal people of that, like the most people in that republic, the Republican principle, it's just like an old school of saying like the most people in the republic, uh, so meant majority rule, will allow the defeat of sinister views by regular vote. More problematic problematic are passionate groups that come together as a minority, as a majority. The large republic with a diversity of interests makes this unlikely, particularly when its separation of powers works to filter and tame such passions by incentivizing the development of complex democratic majorities. In the extended republic of the United States, and among the great variety of interests, parties, and secrets which it embraces, a coalition of majority of the whole society could seldom take place on any... Okay. Madison had previewed this argument at the Constitutional Convention, was the only, okay, term democracy, arguing that diversity of interests was the only defense against the inconveniences of democracy and consistent with the democratic form of government. Okay, he still hasn't really made any like, boom, got your points, okay? We're halfway through and he hasn't really nailed a point yet. Yet while dependent on the people, the Constitution did not embrace simple majoritarian democracy. The states with unequal populations got equal representation in the Senate. So that's what stops mob rule, right? If we just had our House of Representatives, then it would just be mob rule. But we have the Senate, which every state gets two. And so when you know things get passed in the House and then they have to go to the Senate, you know, you might be, you know, California gets all these representatives in the House, but then once it goes to the Senate, 
California gets two senators, you know, and then Alabama gets two senators, right? Yet while dependent on the people, the constitution did not embrace, okay, the states with unequal population got equal representation in the Senate. Yep. The electoral college also gave the states weight as states in selecting the president. But the centrality of states, a concession to political reality, was balanced by the House of Representatives, where the principle of representation by population prevailed. Okay, so deter dependent on how much people you have in your state that's how many representatives you get and which would make up the overwhelming number of electoral votes when selecting a president but none of this justified my okay this is where okay he's starting to get into his argument and we're like literally <laughs> come on dude but maybe he's just setting it up okay but let's just take our time um but none of this justified minority rule which was at odds with the republican principle None of this justified. I don't understand. Like, what is minority rule? How, how are we in minority rule right now? You know, the majority of Americans voted for Biden and then we got Biden. You know, the majority of America, like, you know, like sometimes that's that's the thing of a democratic co constitutional republic is sometimes the minority will win because that's like the way it's set up. But that doesn't mean that the minority always wins. But none of this, Madison's Madison's design remained one of the popular governments precisely. Madison's design remained one of the one of popular governments, one of the popular government remained a pop or a typo, precisely because it would require the building of political majorities over time. As Madison argued in Federal Number 63, the cool and deliberate sense of the community ought in all governments and actually will in all free governments ultimately prevail over the views of its rulers. The cool and deliberate sense of the community, so the people in all governments and actually will in all free governments ultimately prevail over the views of its rulers. <clears throat> Alexander Hamilton, one of Madison's co-authors of the Federalist Papers, echoed this argument. Hamilton made the case for popular... Maybe I'm just dumb, but I'm not following this at all. Hamilton made the case for popular government and even called it democracy. A representative democracy where the right of election is well secured and regulated and the exercise of the legislative executive and judiciary th authorities is vested in select persons. That sounds like a constitutional republic chosen really and not nominally by the people will, in my opinion, be most likely to be happy, regular, and durable. Alexander Hamilton. Okay, made the case. Let's see what this goes to. Okay, let's see. Who did he send this to? Apple F, Apple V. Okay, so this is where he talks about it. So now we're getting into more stuff. Compound governments, though they may be harmon harmonious in the beginning, will introduce distinct interests. And these interests will clash, throw the state into convulsions, and produce a change of dissolution. When the deliberative or judicial powers are vested wholly or partly in the collective body of the people, you must expect error, confusion, and instability. But a representative democracy, where the right of election is well secured and regulated, an exercise of legislative, executive, and judiciary authorities is vested in select persons, chosen really and not nominally by the people, will, in my opinion, be most likely to be happy, regular, and durable. Okay. That the complexity of your legislative will occasion delay and dilatoriness is evident, and I fear may be attended with much greater evil as expedition is not very material in making laws, especially when the government is well digested and matured by time. The evil, I mean, is that in time, your Senate, from the very name and from the mere circumstance of its beginning, of its being a separate member of the legislature, rather, 
will be liable to degenerate into a body purely aristoc aristocratical. And I think the danger of an abuse of power from a simple, a, a simple legislative would not be very great in a government where the equality and fullness of popular representation is so widely provided for as in yours. On the whole, though, I think there are the defects intimidated, in, intimated. I think your government far the best that we have yet seen and capable of giving long and substantial happiness to the people. Objections to it should be suggested with great caution and reserve. I, this moment, receive the favor of your lover of the 16th. I partly agree and partly disagree with you respecting the deficiencies of your constitution, that there is a want of vigor in the executive, I believe, believe will be found true. To determine the qualifications proper for the chief executive magistrate requires the deliberate wisdom of a select assembly and cannot be safely lodged with the people at large. The instability is inherent in the nature of popular governments, I think very disputable. And stable democracy is an epithet frequently in the mouths of politicians, but I believe that from a strict examination of the matter from the records of history, it will be found that the fluctuation of governments in which the popular principle has borne a considerable sway has proceeded from its being compounded with other principles and from its being made to operate in, a, in an improper channel. Compound governments, though they may be harmonious in the beginning, will introduce distinct interests, and these interests will clash throughout – okay. The enemy's still in the... Okay. All right. I'm starting to get tired. Okay. So, okay. So, all right. Just want to make sure that like, you know, he wasn't like misquoting. It sounds like, yeah. I mean, that's the way that they used to write. I'm just not good at that. I'm not, I have never really been like a big reader. So this is kind of like, this is hard for me to understand, frankly. Um, but sounds like, okay, we're good. Um, yeah. And he was saying what this guy's saying. Okay. So the American experiment as advanced by Hamilton and Madison sought to redeem the cause of popular government against its checkered history. Given the success of the experiment by the standards of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, we would come to use the term democracy as a stand-in for representative democracy, a distinct as distinct from direct democracy. But if they wanted a, I don't know, I mean, I, I just feel like I must be like missing something. I'm not trying to not like, I'm not trying to just be like, oh, you know, like this guy's wrong. And then just say, I just, if they didn't want a representative democracy, then why did they make that? Or like, if they didn't want a constitutional republic and he wanted a more popular democracy, then why did they create something that was directly the opposite of that? You know what I mean? I just, it doesn't really make sense. The American experiment. Okay. So consider that President Abraham Lincoln facing a civil war, which he termed the great test of popular government. Use constitutional republic and democracy synonymously, eloquently casting the American experiment. Okay, I'm just going to leave this because I'm, whew, man, I'm like getting, oh my gosh, this is going to be so long. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, guys. All right. Okay, I might just have to go into this one and finish this because I don't think I can go back to that other one. Oh, we might just end up calling this quits for tonight and then uh, like finish this and then yeah, we're just, yeah, I just want, and I know I'll post this too, because um, I'll just say like bad one, don't watch, whatever. Consider that President Abraham Lincoln facing a civil war, which he termed the greatest test of popular, used constitutional republic and democracy synonymously. Okay. Whoa. Oh my gosh, guys, this is going to require so much work. This is insane, dude. Insane. Okay, let's just go back to this because that, that, that one's like driving me down like 17 million different avenues. 
and I'm not trying to not give his, his due. Uh, that's something I would like to look into more because um, I always thought that it was a pretty clear cut case that constitutional Republic. That's what we have. It would be honestly, it'd be super cool. You know what I'll do? I will look up a YouTube video and then I'll probably link that out on my channel and then let two people who really know what they're talking about debate. Cause I I'm, you know, I don't, that was just like worded weirdly and it's not his argument, like the text. And it was like making me hard to, you know, making it hard to like understand. Anyway. Okay. I know guns. So that let's just stick to what I know. George Washington is hardly the only found. Okay. These words are first the strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep. Okay. So uh, Google searches all it takes to discover the majority of pro-gun quotes commonly attributed. Okay. Jefferson also did not say the beauty. Okay. John Adams, who was famously... Um, John Adams, who was famously suspicious of unrest among common people. Okay, so that's where we got into like the whole, you know, crazy, you know, constitutional republic stuff. Okay. Would never have declared arms in the hand of the citizens may be used at individual discretion for the defense of the country, the overthrow of tyranny, or private self-defense. Wait, John Adams, who was famously suspicious of unrest among common people, would never have declared arms in the hands of citizens may be used at individual discretion for the defense of the country, the overthrow of tyranny or private self-defense. Who said that? That sounds like exactly what John Adams would say. And Alexander Hamilton could never have said the best we can help for concern, the best we can help Hope for concern, help for concerning the people at large. The best we can hope for concerning the people at large, another typo, this guy needs to edit his work, is that they may be properly armed. In the 184th Federalist Paper, as is claimed on a prominent program website, because there were only 85 Federalist Paper. Okay, so I guess what he's saying is that people say that he said this and he never actually said it. But then you look at this and you go to John Adams. John Adams began his opening statement. Every act of authority of one man over another for which there is not an absolute necessity is tyrannical. Adams upheld the right of arms in the hands of citizens to be used at individual discretion in private self-defense. And that comes from 26, which is J John Adams, a defense of the constitution of government of the United States of America. So that seems to fly right in the face of what this guy's talking about. I'm glad I found that paper. Um, fake quotes like these are abundant and they're not confined. So, you know, I'm not saying that like these quotes might be fake. Right. But then you can also, you know, like who's who's coming up with these quotes? Who said this? You know, maybe someone, you know, maybe this is like telephone, you know, and then someone said something, you know, someone changed it out, you know, and then eventually it gets to be like this totally like different thing down the road. And then he never actually said that. And now this guy is taking something that some person said that he said and then saying he didn't say that he never would have said that. It's like, OK, he didn't say that thing, but he said something like that. That doesn't disregard all the other things that he said. Fake quotes like these are abundant and they're not confined to fringe message boards or bumper stickers. They are widespread and they've found their way to the top of the program mainstream. And the, see what he's doing is he's straw manning the argument, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm steel manning the argument and I'm having a hard time coming up with steel manning the opposing argument because all of the arguments I'm finding against guns seem to be straw man arguments. You know, he's, he's taking one quote and like, this is just, this is, you know, just my opinion on this, but like he's taking one quote. I don't know this, but it seems to be that he's taking one quote that he didn't say and then kind of casting that onto all the other possible quotes that he could have said that were in support of the Second Amendment and then discounting everything. And that's, you know, that's straw manning an argument. Like if you, like this is, like debates just garbage nowadays because people just try and just play gotcha, you know, do your research, dude. 
Fake quotes like these are abundant. And they're not confined. They are widespread and they've found their way to the top of the pro-gun mainstream. I wonder what he has to say about all these other quotes. In the first chapter of his book, Guns, Crime, and Freedom, Wayne LaPierre, the executive of the NRA, argued that several important figures in early American history believed that the population should be armed in the manner that the NRA currently endorses. In support of his argument, LaPierre misquoted James Madison, cited a deleted sentence from the second draft of the Virginia Bill of Rights, as if it were in the actual Virginia Bill of Rights. Okay. All right. Okay. He's this guy's given us source material. So let's let's do our research and look it up. Okay. So one of the things that was in here was English Bill of Rights. Just 10 days after James Madison proposed, okay, I'm just trying to find the English Bill of Rights provision that subjects may have, okay. Okay, that just goes back to the top. Okay, um, all right. Let's see what this guy has to say. I just want to see if that was in there. Um, and took famous non-gun related quotes from John Adams and Benjamin Franklin out of context to make it seem like they'd support today's NRA. This is not some independent printout being sold at a gun rally or an email chain letter. This book is a published, highly regarded source for people arguing in favor of the NRA's position on gun control, and it's riddled with inaccuracies and fake quotes. Okay, so let's... That went nowhere. All right. Fake history at the crossroads where legend and hype meet. Americans have the right and advantage of being armed, unlike the citizens of other countries whose governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. Okay, in the Federalist Papers, number 46, no, two phrases are his, but the words linking them are not. In 77... Okay, all right, so down here is what it says. Okay, so, all right, so let's just read the whole thing. It may well be doubted, whether a militia thus circumstanced could ever be conquered by such a proportion of regular troops. Those who are best acquainted with the last successful re resistance of this country against the British arms, the American Revolution, will be most inclined to deny the possibility of it. Besides the advantage of being armed, <clears throat> which the Americans possess over the people of almost every other nation, the existence of subordinate governments to which the people are attached and by which the militia officers are appointed forms a barrier against the enterprises of ambition more insurmountable than any which a simple government of any more form can admit of. Notwithstanding the military establishments in the several kingdoms of Europe, which are carried as far as the public resources will bear, the governments are... And I, I hope I'm not just like... I hope I'm... I feel like I'm being honest here. He misquoted him, but he, all he did was a dot, dot, dot. He, he misquoted, cited a deleted... Okay, so he misquoted James Madison. No, he didn't. Look, let's do this again. Americans have the right advantage of being armed, unlike the citizens of other countries whose governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. He's not taking him out of context here. Besides the advantage of being armed, which the Americans possess over the people of almost every other nation, 
And then he goes into the existence of subordinate governments to which the people are attached and by which the militias are appointed, forms a barrier against the enterprises of ambition more insurmountable than any which a simple government of any form can admit of. Notwithstanding the military establishments in the several kingdoms of Europe, which are carried as far as the public resources will bear. So let's just make sure I'm not miss. Okay. The existence of subordinate governments. I'm sorry. I'm like slow when it comes to reading words like this. Like when it comes to reading this type of like language, I am dumb as a rock. Besides the advantage of being armed, which the Americans. Okay. Besides the advantage. Okay. Besides the advantage of being armed which the Americans possess over the people. Over the existence of subordinate governments. So people under their power because they have arms to which the people are attached. Okay. Because they're their government and by which the militia officers are appointed. So the militia officers are appointed by the government forms a barrier against the enterprises of ambition more insurmountable than any which a simple government of any form can admit of okay so all those barriers present prevent i think i'm if i'm reading this right it's a barrier against enterprises of an ambition from a simple government being able to basically it's too insurmountable they're not going to be able to like take over this like militia so notwithstanding Sorry, I'm so dumb, guys. Not with standing meaning. Sorry. In spite of not with saying despite, despite, okay. Despite, let's use that because that'll help me out. Okay, so despite the military establishments in the several kingdoms of Europe. Okay, so despite the military, okay, so despite the military establishments in the several kingdoms of Europe, which are carried as far as the public resources will bear, the governments are afraid to trust the people. Yeah, I think I'm reading this right. I just want to make sure I'm not like I. I really want to like do my research on this. He misquoted me, James Madison. All he got, guys, this is all he did was a classic thing that people do when they don't want to like take an entire. You know, he wants to clear it up because I just how long did I just spend to make sure that I was reading that correctly? five minutes, you know, and all Wayne LaPierre wanted to do was to make sure that people weren't doing what I just did. He wanted to make it easier. So he combined two things, cut out all the jargon, and then we're going to affect how the various states had to ratify and proponents and opponents produced pamphlets and newspapers. My, uh, the context he wrote, I must argue that the existence of okay, so just let's put all this in context. In 1787, the Constitutional Convention produced a plan for new federal government for the former British colonies in America. Before it could go into effect, however, the various states had to ratify it. And proponents and opponents, proponents and opponents, produced pamphlets and newspaper columns arguing its merits. One question involved the proposed federal army. Might it not become an instrument of tyranny? Oh, might it not become an instrument of tyranny? Madison argued that the existence of state militias should prevent that possibility. In that context, he wrote that in America, the advantage of being armed, which the Americans possess, gives them the ability to fight back from these governments and prevent them from taking over. And these other governments in Europe are afraid to trust the people with arms. He's not take, he's not, he didn't misquote him. He did not misquote him. Cited a deleted sentence, Jesus. Sorry, God. A deleted sentence from the second draft of Virginia Bill's rights as if it were, in, okay. Oh my gosh. Okay, all right. So let's do this again. Monticello.org. The sentence that he misquoted comes from Thomas Jefferson's three drafts of the Virginia Constitution. The text varies slightly from the first draft to the subsequent draft. So the first draft, okay, let's see, what, what did he do? He did from the second, 
deleted sentence from the second draft as if it were in the actual Virginia Bill of Rights. So he did. You got to be. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Fair enough. I, I was misunderstanding. Okay. Is this sentence from... This sentence does not appear. Okay, no free man shall be debar debarred the use of arms within his own lands or tenements. This sentence does not appear in the Virginia Constitution as adopted. Okay. No, this sentence, no free man shall ever be debarred, is often seen paired with the following. The strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is, as a last resort, to protect themselves against tyranny and government. The letter sentence does not appear in the Virginia Constitution drafts or text as adopted, nor in any other known Jefferson writings. Okay, all right, sounds good. So he was right on one, he was wrong on another, right? So he's now taking two things and claiming that it's like one. Now, to his credit, this one does seem to be um, a, a misquote on Wayne LaPierre's part. Um, I would like to know what Wayne LaPierre said as if it, okay, so it sounded like he he made it seem like it was in the actual Virginia, like according to the Virginia Bill of Rights or whatever, according to what Jefferson wrote. <clears throat> he took a famous non-gun related quotes from John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. This is not some, okay, so people invoke the founding fathers in to, to, in, in to, to pretty often here in the US. This guy's got to edit his stuff. And this is a dubious tactic for a number of reasons. For one, the founding fathers were deeply flawed by today's standards. Wait, so that's his whole argument? Wait, so he took a couple quotes that people didn't say. Okay, and now he's getting into the race thing? <laughs> okay all right let's do it for one the founding fathers were deeply flawed by today's standards they were create they were creating a slave-holding nation where only land-owning white protestant men had the right to vote or hold office okay the founding fathers were also a group of men who disagreed with one another on pretty much every conceivable topic claiming the founding fathers felt a singular way about a specific idea is like claiming all sports fans unanimously consider peyton manning the all-time best quarterback. Also, the record of what the founding fathers said and believed is incomplete. We have record of the speeches and writings by some founding fathers, but not others. Twitter did not exist in the 18th century. To invoke the founding fathers at all is to invoke men whose words have been amended and reinterpreted many times in order to fit, I'm just going to sit like this, the, the evolution of American society. So any claim that the founding fathers would have all collectively felt one way or another about one of today's political issues is probably not true. Okay, whoa. What did the founding fathers really say about guns? Okay, guys, listen. He is he is saying that he didn't say this. He didn't say this. He didn't say this. He didn't say this. And then he gets all the way to his point and says they didn't all agree. And so to say... So any claim that the founding fathers would have all collectively felt one way or another about one of today's political issues is probably not true. At the very least, this type of claim is not provable. He, now, again, straw manning, right? You can make the argument that like one of the founding fathers didn't you know, do that, but that does not negate the entire Second Amendment. You have to... Like that, you know, they still put it in there. They still put it in there. You know what I mean? And again, you know, like, you know, he he's taking like these couple of like like this one, um, I don't know, a couple like misquoted things, and then making it sound like these people never said stuff like that. What was the George Washington? And remember, this is what every act of authority of one way or another, okay, coax. His own firearms are this. Um, all right, let's just finish this up. 
and believed is incomplete. Okay, to invoke the founding, okay, so any claim that the founding, okay, is not proven, but it's absolutely true that the founding fathers, and more specifically the intent of the men involved in the creation of the Bill of Rights, are at the core of the issue of guns in this country. Fully understanding the framers' intent regarding the Second Amendment is the key to dissect and discussing the issue of guns in American society. Guns were everywhere in colonial America. Each colony relied on an armed citizenry to defend against aggression from Native Americans and the French. Men were generally required to own at least one firearm for this purpose and to have a firearm on their person at all times. In some places, this included a mandate that guns be brought everywhere, including to church. When an organized fighting force was needed, Okay, all right, so let's hear them out. When an organized fighting force was needed, each colony had its own militia made up of part-time citizen soldiers that were called to action and disbanded. Okay, when an organized fighting force was needed, each colony had its own militia made up of part-time citizen soldiers that were called to action and disbanded as needed. And this militia was usually supported by private citizens carrying their own weapons. This tradition continued into the American Revolution, where the new centralized Continental Army was supplement. Okay, so I just want to say one thing, though. When an organized fighting force was needed, each colony had its own militia made up of part-time citizen soldiers that were called to action and disbanded as needed. I'm just curious. I'm not trying, like, this is, you know, it's not crazy to say this. Like, the whole way that our entire country was formed was through a fight with a tyrannical government. So just because we don't need them now... What is to say that someone coming in, I mean, say we disarmed the entire American populace, right? We actually were able to take away all the guns. What happens when a tyrannical person does get into power? So I don't know. I feel like you're not being honest when you say an organized fighting, when an organized fighting force was needed, each colony had its own militia. So yeah, they said that, you know, they needed their own militia. But this is now disregarding the argument that at the time they needed the militia for one thing, right? Which was to prevent abuse like Native Americans because they didn't have an army. But what happens if that militia is needed to literally fight back against your own government? What happens then, right? And then you don't have any guns. And this militia was usually supported by private citizens. This tradition continued into the American Revolution, where the new centralized Continental Army was supplemented by local and state militias armed with privately owned weapons. There were also no police forces in colonial times. Policing was largely done by elected sheriffs and local militia. What became our Second Amendment is the result of the new nation deciding on the best way to defend itself now that the colonies had become the United States. Oh, boy, I thought this was almost done. Oh, man, this is going to be a long one. The records of the Federal Convention of 1787 are the fundamental primary source that we have regarding the intent of the group of men collectively called the Framers while they were drafting the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. They took detailed notes of the debates they were having, and their debates regarding what became the Second Amendment are entirely limited to the topic of national defense. They took detailed notes of the debates they were having, and their debates regarding what became the Second Amendment are entirely limited to the topic of national defense. Okay, I just this this guy over here though. Close these out. This guy over here, you know, talks about them carrying guns everywhere. And this guy, so this guy's talking about how they carry guns everywhere. This guy is now saying that the reason they did that was what? Because I'd like to see real quick in 1778, 1776. I'm just trying to see if like after the ratification of the constitution, if there were any quotes from here.
Hey, just 10 days after James Madison proposed the Bill of Rights to Congress in 1789, Tench Cox, a prominent Federalist and lifelong correspondent of Jefferson and Madison, wrote that what became the Second Amendment would confirm the people and their right to keep and bear their private arms. James Madison endorsed the widely public article in which these words appear, and that came from 33, Madison to Tench Cox in 12, the papers of James Madison, 257. Okay, so we have papers of him endorsing this widely published article in which these words appear. Cox's writings provide unmistakable evidence that the 18th century Americans defined muskets, rifles, and pistols as arms, and that they endorsed an individual right to own and keep and use arms and consequently for, of self-defense and of the public militia power. So for both. I'm getting really tired, guys. It's 1030. I've been like going at this for a while. Um, I did the other one like just before this too. So I'm like. The means of defense against foreign danger. No one's going to be here anyway. No one's already watching. I'm here by all by myself. All by my lonesome. I do have a glass of whiskey. So. For the most part, it is clear. Okay, so let's get back to this. Their entire okay, so the Second Amendment and their debates at the drafting the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the debates they were having about the Second Amendment were entirely limited to the topic of national defense. <clears throat> I guess he guy can't like I don't know maybe he could. Uh, this guy this guy sourced everything. It's like where are your sources, right? According to who were these? topics like entirely uh on the topic of national defense this guy though is giving us at least a better argument right like this is this is making me think this the other guy you know this is a much better like written article for the most part it is clear that the framers approved of this part-time militia system and feared the potential of a centralized standing army james madison said the means of defense against foreign danger have been always the interim instruments of tyranny at home the means of defense against foreign danger have always been the instruments of tyranny at home. The means of defense against foreign danger have always been the instruments. I'm getting way too tired. The means of defense against foreign people have been always the instruments among the Romans, it was a standing maxim to excite a war whenever a revolt was apprehended. Throughout all Europe, the armies kept up under the pretext of defending, having have enslaved the people. Oh, okay. So, like, governments will, like, start war just to basically scare people. So that they can basically lock down their own people and be like, hey, we're doing it for your own good. We're trying to protect you from like these foreign powers. The framers approved of this part-time militia. Okay. Eldbridge Jerry, a congressman from Massachusetts to Madison's future vice president, echoed this sentiment. What, sir, is the use of a militia? It is to prevent the establishment of a standing army. The bane of liberty. Okay, so that's, but that's important. I want to like I'm not I'm not trying to cherry pick here, but we have to take this entire document in context. And remember, I I said in this remember and at the at this one right like this is this is a very important point. As the founding fathers realized, every right has its costs, but the alternatives are often more costly. And so I'm you know I'm not trying to cherry pick, but what sir is the use of a militia? It is to prevent the establishment of a standing army, the bane of liberty. Whenever government mean to invade the rights and liberties of the people, they always attempt to destroy the militia in order to raise an army upon their ruins. Okay, Elbridge Jerry, very pro 2 a statement right there. And Robert Yates, an anti-federalist, appears to perhaps have been as skeptical of the militia as he was of an army. What would you use military force? What would you use military force to compel the observance of a social compact? It is destructive to the rights of the people. 
Do you expect the militia will do it, or do you mean a standing army? The first will never, on such an occasion, ex okay, so, forced to compel the observance of a social compact. It is destructive to the rights of the people. Do you expect the militia will do it, or do you mean a standing army? The first will never, the militia will never, on such an occasion, exert any power. And the latter, the army, may turn its arms against the government which employs them. True, but that's definitely not always the case, right? Um, you know, like in Germany, the Germans were all too happy to um, murder six million Jews. There was also a fairly passionate debate. I love that he is giving us source materials, though. This is great. Sorry, nobody's listening to me anyway. They're also fairly passionate. Okay, man, I'm only halfway done. This is this is rough. There's also a fairly passionate debate regarding the rights of pacifists in wartime. If the militia were conscripting citizens, should Quakers and the like be forced to fight? And if not, should they be compelled to find a replacement? These two issues debate over the merits of a standing army versus a regulated militia and the rights. Okay, so this is, you know, going towards costs and benefits, right? There are always going to be costs. But what are the benefits? And do the costs or the benefits outweigh the other? Which one, which one outweighs the other? Rights of individual. Okay, there is no record of any discussion of the rights of individual citizens to bear arms outside of the context of the militia. Let's just do like like a quick like thought experiment here, and I have to do it by myself, which kind of sucks. But like, if a bunch of people in a room, remember they all carry. The reason they all carry is because it's very normal. They have for a long time, um, you know, but people like will attack them every so often and, you know, they have to be able to defend themselves. So they're all together in a room and they're trying to like talk about the second amendment, but their biggest concern is the army that they, you know, just fought currently fighting. And how do they make sure that, you know, they have a strong enough army to keep the government in control what it should be in control, but it doesn't get so big that a private militia couldn't put it back in its place. And so why didn't they think about talking about the rights of individual citizens to bear arms outside of the context of the militia? I don't know. Am I crazy to say that that's because it was like, you don't even need to say it, right? If someone, if someone had said, well, what about, what about, do we have a right to bear arms like outside the house? Like, they'd be like, shut up, Jerry. No one asked you sit down. Of course we do. You know, like, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. You know, um, like it was, it would have been such a preposterous and outlandish idea that that's the reason that they didn't bring it up. Cause it was like almost just something that didn't even need to be discussed. I don't, I don't know. But, you know, like, why didn't they talk about it? But it, it sounds like from this other article that, like, they all carried all the time. And so maybe it was just, it seems like it is more likely than not, I think, that it's the reason they didn't discuss the right of the citizens, the individual citizens to bear arms right here outside of the context of the militia was because that was something that they had just directly had issue with, you know, and they're trying to figure out the best way to form a government. And if someone had said, Hey, you know, do we let people actually like carry guns or own guns, you know, at all people be like, are you out of your damn mind? Are you pretty crazy? You know, I feel like that's probably the more likely I'm trying to do a thought experiment. I'm trying to be honest here. Several drafts included 
include clauses to the effect of a standing army of regular troops in time of peace is dangerous to public liberty, and such shall not be raised or kept up in time of peace, but from necessity. But this was eventually dropped by majority vote. Several drafts or proposals also include clauses to the effect of no person religiously scrupulous shall be compelled to bear arms, but this too never made it into the Bill of Rights. There were several proposed amendments that included an explicit individual right to keep and bear arms. Or a prohibition against disarming private citizens, but they were not included in the Second Amendment, and there are no records of this topic being debated. For example, the delegation. Okay, there were several proposed amendments that included an explicit... For example, the delegation from New Hampshire proposed this. Okay, cool. He's giving us he's giving us source material. Um, Congress shall never disarm any citizen unless such as are or have been in actual rebellion, which that would have made it in. This never made it into the second into the recorded debates and was not in any of the drafts of what became the Second Amendment. What we are left with is this, a well-regulated militia being us to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This is a confusing sentence at best. I mean, I'll give you this. It is, right? It is. It is four sentence fragments separated awkwardly by commas, and the second two sentence fragments can reasonably be seen as non sequitur to the first two. It is four sentence fragments separated awkwardly by commas, and the second two sentence fragments can reasonably be seen as a non sequitur to the first two. So that means that if you, like a lot of people, focus on the right of the people to keep their arms shall not be infringed. But what it's saying is if you don't take it in context with this, the right of the, the a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep their arms shall not be infringed. Okay. So maybe let's just, let's just stop here. And I'm going to try and like, just give an honest little. Yeah. So we'll stop at the second amendment. That'll be easy for me to remember like where to like, keep going. Let's just read this for a second and think about everything that we've gone over and everything that we've discussed and learned. What can we kind of, what can we glean from this statement ourselves? A well-regulated militia. And I'm way too tired to do this right now, but we're going to give it a go. A well-regulated militia. A militia is... Important because they just fought a, like a war against a standing army. They really hate standing armies. I don't even know if I can do this because my brain is so fried. Being necessary to the security of a free state. Well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Yeah, I'm too tired to like go through this and try to remember all the things that we've discussed. All right, I think I'm just going to call it quits there for tonight, people. I usually have pretty good energy. Okay, until next time, stay safe, live free, get some sleep, and I'll talk to you later. See ya. I'm so tired. This is taking so much energy out of me to like learn about all this stuff. And I really want to like, you know, I want, if I ever go on to like the reason I'm doing this, just if you've made it to this point, cheers to you first off. Cheers to you. Also, by the way, I made two videos tonight. I'm not like pounding whiskey on a regular basis. I poured this after I put my kids to bed, which was at eight o'clock. It's now 11 and I've drank about a shot. So um, I drank about one drink and about 
three hours. So I am not sitting here pounding whiskey as I make these videos, just so you know. But no one's going to know that by the time they get to this because no one's going to get here. If you ever get here, if you ever get here, if there's, if I become so big that people delve into this and watch all my stuff, if you ever, I have a question. If you ever get here, figure out a way to contact me. And I, the first person who tags me gets to this point in the video because this was the most brutal video of all time. We got to figure out a way to make, make this happen. You call my company. It's going to be massive. You call my company. And you say, Garrick Romeo owes me a hundred bucks. Adjusted for inflation. First person to get in contact with me who watches this whole video. Gets to the end. Pay you a hundred bucks. I wonder how long it's going to take for somebody to do that. Probably a while because this was a brutal video. I was all over the place. Anyway, live free, people. I'll talk to you later. See ya.